God, how true. This earth for this congregation. Been in the storm so long. Time to pray. As we carve out these last few moments, is there good news in the midst of being in the storm? There is. Let us see it. Let us sense it. Let us embrace it. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's talk about a coin toss. You know what a coin toss is, don't you? When they play the Super Bowl, the two teams, captains from both teams, will gather in the center of the field with the referee. You'll have a coin, not unlike this. It'll, be a, it'll actually be a commemorative coin. This is a silver dollar. You say, all right, gentlemen, come here, come here, come here. This is the heads. This is tails. I want the visiting team to make the call. Well, who's visiting? Everybody's visiting. It's the team of the worst record of the two. You make the call. So he'll take that coin and he will flip it up, only he won't catch it. It goes to the turf, stoops over, picks it up. Voila! Here's the result. Interestingly enough, 50 Super Bowl games, 24 of the times the team that won the coin toss won the game. It was a big deal. The big deal is this. All to make this point, if you're going to have a coin toss, you have to have a coin with two sides on it. If it doesn't have two sides, you're living in a two-dimensional world. Three dimensions, you have to have. Every coin has two sides. If it, it's the two sides together that make the coin valuable. So once upon a time, God minted a pure gold coin. Absolutely, exquisitely, the most expensive in the universe. And he called the coin salvation. And guess what? It has two sides. Do you know the two sides to the coin of salvation? Open your Bible up. Let's go. The words of Jesus. John chapter 15. Thank you, Robert, for reading in Portuguese. John chapter 15. Take a look at this. The words of Jesus. Two sides to the salvation coin. So I'm in the NIV. I'm going to find it here. You find it in your translation. Didn't bring a Bible. Grab the pew Bible in front of you, page 727. Bright red letters. This is late Thursday night. Only 11 disciples now. In less than 24 hours, Jesus will be dead. John 15, let's pick it up in verse 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me, some of your translations read, if you abide in me. If you, if you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Zero, nada, nothing. All right? Now, do, do you see the two sides of the coin? They're right there. Did you see them? Let's write it down. Grab your study guide right now. Let's just scribble this down because this is absolutely critical to understand the two sides. Find a study guide in your worship bulletin. You didn't get a, you didn't get a worship bulletin? Come on, ushers. Here they come. Hold your hand up. They're going to get a study guide to you up in the balcony the same. And those of you watching right now, we're glad to have you on live streaming. You're already on our website, so go to the website and run off real quick the study guide. By the way, if you have your device with you, 
You got your smartphone with you? You do it all on the smartphone. What's the website? www. Please put it on the screen. Newperceptions.tv. You go to that website, click on number three. What is the series? Storm, Finding Jesus in the Gathering Dark, where it says study guide under part three. You can do it all on your phone. You never have to have paper again. It's a paperless study guide world. You carry these with you forever. All right, let's go. So let's fill it in. What we just read, the words of Jesus, jot it down, Jesus speaking, if you remain in me, hit the pause button right there. We will call that, we will call that the we are in Christ side of the coin. Remember, there are two sides. So that's the we are in Christ side of the coin. Jot that down, please. We are in Christ. So Jesus says, if you remain in me and I remain in you, whoop, there's the flip side of the coin. We'll call that the Christ is in us side of the coin. Jot that down. You remain in me and I remain in you, then you will bear much fruit. Plain and simple, ladies and gentlemen, the coin has two sides. One side is the we are, we are in Christ's side. Turn the coin over. Christ is in us side. You have to have both sides. If you don't have both sides, you don't have the coin and you don't have the value. Now, let's do it. Let's put it up as a graphic. Put it up as a graphic, please, on the screen. Let's go back to that we are in Christ side. What's that? That is God's gift of forgiveness. Forgiveness. So you got this in your study guide. That's God's gift of forgiveness. With the Christ is in us side, that's God's gift of, of fruit. Both are gifts. The fruit, the forgiveness. Two sides of the coin. Two gifts. The first side of the coin, the gift of forgiveness, that's the theological term called justification. We don't use this language. This generation doesn't even know. What are you talking about? We don't use it anymore. But that's what this, that building over there calls it, justification. The other side of the coin, Christ is in us, that's what they call sanctification. Now, you see what's on there in yellow? That's, that's what came to me after we printed the study guide. So you're going to have to scribble this down real quick because the contrast goes on. On the we are in Christ side of the coin, that's what changes our external status. Forgiveness, justification. It changes our external status. Flip the coin over. Christ is in us side of the coin. That's what, that's what changes our internal state. Something changes inside of us. One more. Keep writing. The we are in Christ side of the coin. That's what declares, declares our righteousness, our right being. You flip the coin over. What's that side of the coin? Christ is in us. That's what demonstrates our righteousness. Now, this is going to come clear in just a moment, but the two sides. You say, Dwight, but listen, come on, please. What's the big deal? Who cares? Two sides. Ah, here's the big deal. Keep the, keep the graphic up, please. Because some people are in big trouble. You know why? Because they emphasize only one side of the coin. They act as if there is no other side. So you can do that with the uh, we are in Christ. You just say, hey, hallelujah, I'm saved. Grace, grace, grace. Yo, give me a high five, Jesus. And that's all they talk about. The, the flip side is just as true. Some people jump to the bottom and they say, Christ is in us. Hey, behavior. You got to get your behavior together. You got you to have fruit in your life. And that's all they talk about. You need to be able to spot those kind of people because the moment you see them, they only got half a coin, and one-sided coins are of no value. You have to have both sides. Coin of salvation, Jesus says, there are two sides to it. And Paul comes along and he says, amen. Yeah, Paul agrees with Christ. Put the words on the screen. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. I am crucified with Christ. Oh, hit the pause button there. Scribble it in your study guide. That's the we are in Christ side. You weren't at Calvary. I wasn't in Calvary, but he took us to Calvary, and he took our sins there. We are in Christ. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but, oh, here it comes. Christ lives where? In me. That's the Christ in us side of the same coin. Keep reading. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. There they are, ladies and gentlemen, two sides to the salvation coin. We are in Christ. Christ is in us. And once you know these two sides, you're going to spot it all the way through the New Testament. Boom, 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 boom. But with your permission, I'd like to concentrate on the second side of the coin because actually hashtag RXF for NOW, our little series last fall, we were focusing on the we are in Christ. Now, few little times we have with the storm series Let's flip the coin over. Christ is in us. Is that just Jesus' words that uh, bring that to us? 
One little line and you're making a big case out of it? Are you kidding? Get your pen running. I'm not going to comment on a single one of these verses. I'm going to run them by you. Here they come. Six in a row. Write them down. John 15, 5. We just read that. Abide in me and I in you. That's the second side we're going to concentrate on. Galatians 2, 20. Christ lives in me. We just read that as well. But now fresh territory. Galatians 4, 19. My dear children, for whom I am again in the pains of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. Keep reading. Ephesians chapter 3, 17. Paul says, I pray that Christ may dwell in your hearts. Christ in, inside. Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. Colossians 1, verse 27. This is one of the big ones for Christ in us. God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this gospel, this mystery, which is Christ in you. The hope of glory. One more. Jesus. And by the way, he's speaking to the storm generation. The end game storm generation gets the, uh, it's, it's called Laodicea. He speaks these words to Laodicea. Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. Here I am. I stand at the door and I knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in. Christ in you. I will come in and eat with that person and, and they with me. Yeah, but come on, Dwight. I mean, why are you making such a big deal about the second side of the coin? Oh, I'll tell you why. We just read it. Write it down. John 15, verse 5. What do we read? I am the vine. Jot it down. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much what? What's the next word? You'll bear much fruit. For the God of the universe, I'm talking about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. For the God of the universe, bearing fruit is a huge deal. You know why? Jot this down. Because it is Fruit is the only way to show that the branch is truly connected to the vine. No fruit, there's no connection. No connection, there's no fruit. It's a big deal. In fact, Jesus tells a parable over here in Luke. There's a parable. We never read this one, do we? Luke chapter 13. But he's making the point. Watch this. Luke chapter 13, beginning in verse 6. And Jesus told this parable. Here comes the parable now. A man had a fig tree growing in his vineyard. So Jesus was in the vineyard in John 15. We're still in the vineyard, but here is this one little fig tree growing up out of the vineyard. A man had a fig tree growing in his vineyard, and he went to look for fruit on it, but did not find any. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, the gardener, look, for three years now, I've been coming to look for fruit on this crazy fig tree and haven't found any. I say, cut it down. Why should it take up the soil? And the gardener jumps up. He says, sir, hold it, hold it, hold it. Leave it alone for one more year, and I'll dig around it, and I'll fertilize it, and if it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then psh, cut it down. Would you jot that down, please? If it bears fruit next year, then fine. If not, boom, I cut it down. Ladies and gentlemen, make no mistake about it. God very much wants fruit. You know why? Because fruit bearing is proof to anybody who asks. Who asks. Who wants to know if I am connected to the vine. For anybody who observes, who wants to ascertain, are you connected to the vine? It's a big deal for God because it's God's character on the line. And if he has people who are connected to him, they'll bear the fruit of who he is. It's a big deal. You say, well, I suppose it's a big deal, Dwight. But you know what? It really depends on what kind of fruit you're talking about. Well, how about this fruit? On the screen again, Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. The fruit, write that in, please. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So what did Jesus say? If you abide in me and I abide in you, you will bear much fruit. In other words, it's going to show. Reminds me of that day when Satan came sauntering into the council room in heaven. God spots Satan walking in. He says, yo, Satan, do you see that friend of mine down there? I mean, has there anybody gotten closer to me than that man named Job? What do you think of Job? And Satan just shoots back. Yeah, God, I'll tell you what. You turn off your little blessing machine, and he'll turn away from you. I promise you. God pauses for a moment. He thinks. He said, okay, I'll turn off the blessing machine. You can have at it with him, only don't you kill him. 
All right? And the book of Job is this stunning narrative of a man who, in the midst of crippling calamities, I mean, we're talking about loss of property, loss of the beloved ones, loss of personal health, relentlessly is hanging on to his trust in God. In fact, for me, okay, for me, the, the, the stunning of all stunning lines in Job is this one. When he sobs his confession and he says, even though he slays me, I'm going to trust him. <laughs> Man, if I could borrow a lot language that's going to come from 2,000 years after Job, I, I'd say, look at Job. Obviously, here he is abiding in Christ, and Christ is clearly abiding in him because just look at the fruit. Have you seen my friend Job? Have you seen my friend Tony? Have you seen my friend Stanley? Look. What does Job say? Jot it down. Job's bearing fruit that shows he has the, has the faith of Jesus. Though he slay me, yet will I, and the key word is, yet will I trust him. And what's this uh, faith of Jesus? How did Jesus put it when he was on earth? Hebrews 2.13 says this was, his, this was his life confession. Hebrews 2.13, I will put my trust in him. I'll put my trust in him. Jesus says, abide in me, and I in you. The faith of Jesus is revealed, jot it down one more time, in the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit. Okay, here's Desire of Ages. Oh, this is dynamite. Watch this. Desire of Ages. Herein is my Father glorified, said Jesus, that you bear much fruit. God desires to manifest through you the holiness, the benevolence, the compassion of his own character. That's what fruit is. It's just, yo, man, I look at that guy. It reminds me of God. But, but it gets even better. Watch this. Yet, the Savior does not bid the disciples labor to bear fruit. He tells them instead to abide in him. You know why? Because the fruit of the Spirit it doesn't come by labor. It doesn't come by grunting and straining. I'm going to get this. It comes by abiding, by abiding in him. Abide in me and I in you. So we got four apple trees on our little property. And boy, when they're going, delicious fruit. But I tell you the truth. I go out in the middle of the night. No kidding, this is true. I go out in the middle of the night and I stand near those trees. And I have never in the middle of the night ever heard those apple trees sobbing. I'm trying so hard to bear fruit, but nothing's coming. I'm grunting, I'm panting, I'm straining, but no fruit is popping out. Poor, pitiful me. Never, never heard it. You know why? Because these, little, these four little apple trees, they abide in the soil, and the soil abides in them. They abide under the glorious sun, and the sun abides in them. They abide in the showers of rain, and the rain abides in them. They just stand there, and apparently they bear fruit from that quiet abiding. So maybe that's what it's supposed to be with us. What do we just read? The Savior does not bid us labor, work, strain, groan to bear fruit. Can I put it this way? Let's just shift the metaphors here, move from fruit to relationship. When you fall in love with somebody, and you have, when you fall in love with somebody, you really end up abiding in that person, and that person abides in you. You don't grunt, you don't growl, you don't grit yourself into love. You abide in a very special friendship that deepens the more you abide in each other. You talk. You listen. You keep reminding yourself, two ears, one mouth, two ears, one mouth, to remember the lesson. But the more time you spend together, the deeper it grows. No kidding, really. The more time, the more heartache, the more pain, the more tears you go through together, the deeper grows your love for her, your love for him. You don't take a pill to get this. You don't grunt. 
You just abide in her, in him, even as she, as he abides in you. And ever so surely, ever so slowly, you begin to change. That's how it works in a relationship. Love changes you. The most powerful book I've ever read on marriage is written by a Canadian author named Mike Mason. Title of the book, The Mystery of Marriage as Iron Sharpens Iron. In, in my humble opinion, here is an absolutely brilliant observation. Put the words on the screen for you. Marriage, even under the very best of circumstances, is a crisis, one of the major crises of life. And it is a dangerous thing not to be aware of this. Whether it turns out to be a healthy, challenging, and, con and constructive crisis or a disastrous nightmare depends largely upon how willing the partners are to be changed, how malleable, how changeable they are. Yet, ironically, it is some of the... I love this. It is some of the most hardened and crusty and unlikely people in the world who plunge themselves into the arms of marriage and thereby submit in almost total naivety to the two most transforming powers known to the human heart, the love of another person and the gracious love of God. So, if you're heading down that pathway, jot it down. Be prepared for change. Be prepared for the most sweeping and revolutionary reforms of a light lifetime. That's what Jesus is talking about when he says, Abide in me and I in you. You will bear much fruit. Be prepared for change. Revolutionary change. Ever so slowly, ever so surely, that change just creeps into your relationship. So the question that begs itself. Is how do we, how, how shall we abide, he and us, and us and him? As it turns out, this coin, as it turns out, the faith of Jesus is absolutely essential for both sides of the coin. The faith of Jesus. The question is, Jesus' faith when he was here, how did he get his faith? Ah, oh, come on. Remember that moment? Satan materializes. Shoo! materializes himself. He's standing in front of the emaciated and famished. God made flesh, the Son of God. And with that assault of three blinding temptations, Jesus picks up the challenge. And have you noticed all three temptations, when he responds to the temptation, he begins with the identical words. What are the, what are the words? Do you remember? It is, is written. Yeah. In fact, that first temptation response, jot it down in your study, guide, Matthew 4, 4, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Every word. Now, remember, when God speaks a word, when, when, the, when the omnipotent God speaks a word, the word instantly creates the reality it describes. So when Jesus quotes the word back to the tempter, and he says, and he says, man shall not live by bread alone. In the very speaking of the word, divine power is unleashed in him, and he can stare at those stones that he could turn into bread, and he can say no to his appetite, just like that. Where did the power come from? It was supernaturally infused in him because he believed the word. And he says, man shall not live by bread alone. Psh! All three times. The word of God was huge for Jesus. As he abided in the Father, and the Father abided in him, the Word was the key. In fact, watch this. Jesus is obviously saturated with the Psalms, the, the, the prayer book of his faith community. He, he has memorized the Psalms. The book of Hebrews, chapter 10, says these are actually words Jesus quoted. Jot them down. This is from Psalm 40, verse 8. Jesus speaking, I desire to do your will, my God. Your law is within my heart. So he quotes, the, he quotes the promise, and he says amen to it, and boom, written all over the walls of his heart and his mind. And guess what? You and I say amen to it all over us, the word, the law of God in our hearts. Psalm 119, 11, I have hidden your word in my heart so that I might not sin against you. The Word of God is the secret to Jesus abiding in him and he in Jesus all through his life, all through his mission. And get this, I had never seen this before, but even as he is expiring, he's been hanging on the cross for six hours. Darkness is moving in to swallow him up in that moment just before death. I never knew this before. Did you? Jesus goes to an embedded promise in the Psalms. 
I'm indebted to Cameron Schofield for showing me this in his book, Heralding the Loud Cry. Watch this. You remember when Jesus dies, finally at the end, he cries out rather triumphant exclam exc exclamation. You remember what it was? It, what? It is finished. And then the seventh word of the cross, right after he says it is finished, the final word, Father, and how's it go? Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Now, people have come, and I've taught the cross through the years. <coughs> people have come and say, hey, Dwight, I mean, how do you explain that? Faith. And you know what I've said? It's kind of a wimpy, wimpy reply, but this is what I've, I've, I've used for years. Well, you know, Jesus, before, before he came to Calvary, he, he was telling everybody, I'll be dead for three days, and then I'll come up. I'll be dead for three days, and then I'll rise up. I'll be dead for three days, and I'll rise up. So Jesus remembers the promise. He, he remembers what he's been telling everybody, and he hangs on to that. And how wrong that interpretation is. Thank you, Cameron. You know what Jesus does? As the darkness is, over, is overwhelming him, just as it's about to suck him up, Jesus puts his finger on an embedded promise in the Psalms. Write it down. It's Psalm 16. Unbelievable. Look at these words. It's Jesus speaking, I will keep my eyes always on the Lord. No matter how dark my life right now, I will keep my eyes always on the Lord. I will put my trust in Him. Remember, He lives by that. I will, I will keep my eyes always on the Lord with Him at my right hand. Now watch this. I will not be shaken. Why will you not be shaken as you're dying? Keep reading. Because you will not, write that in, you will not abandon me to the realm of the grave. You will not let me stay in there. You will not keep me in the in the grave, in the realm of the dead. You will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor, write that word in, will you let your faithful one see decay. In his mind, as the darkness overwhelms him, in fact, desire of ages tells us he cannot see past the portals of the tomb. There's no, there's, this is a one-way street into eternal oblivion. But in his mind, as he contemplates that ending, the Spirit brings back to him a promise. You will not let me be held captive in the realm of the dead. You will not let this body decay. And so, in a cry of sheer faith, I'm into that promise. It is finished, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Boom, he's dead. But what God spoke with his lips is instantly created. And that body, locked in the realm of the dead, not a moment of decay. Three days later, poof. Isn't that amazing? Now, Cameron Schofield, I want you to get his point. Words on the screen. If you don't get anything else out of this study, Schofield writing, I want you to listen carefully and get this. Take it home with you and do not forget it. How was it that Christ was able to give himself up into the hands of the Father? How was it that no matter how dark the malignity of sin was, how terrible the weight of guilt, how impossible it seemed that there was any way out, how did he conquer? The italics are his. He believed that God would keep his word. He died. The faith of Jesus, I will put my trust in him even in death. And in that instant, before he dies, the promise appears to him that he had read. How many times have I read the Psalms and never thought about Jesus reading this line? He read it. He knew it. You will not leave me in the realm of the dead. You will not let my body decay. Amen. Dead. And God says, you quoted my word back to me. You quoted my omnipotent word back to me, and because you believe it, you get it. That's the faith of Jesus. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. That would be the, the storm generation, the end time generation. They're known with two characteristics. They keep the commandments of God, and then there's, no, there's no, nothing else. It says, and the faith of Jesus, meaning they keep the faith of Jesus. Your faith won't get you anywhere. You can't get saved by your faith. You and I can only be saved by, our own, by the faith of the Lord Jesus himself. The faith of Jesus. You abide in me. I abide in you. You'll be okay. 
Where did Jesus get His faith? From the Word of God, of course. Where do we get, where do we get the faith of Jesus from? From the Word of God, of course. Let me end with this, Desire of Ages. Let me end with this quotation. It is through the Word, write that in, it is through the Word that Christ abides in His followers. That's how He does it, through the Word. Keep reading. The words of Christ, that would be in the Gospels, are spirit and life. That's John 6, 63. Keep reading. Receiving Christ's words, you receive the life of the vine. You live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. The life of Christ in you produces. Can you believe this? Jot it down. The life of Christ in you produces the same fruits as in him. That's why when you abide in Jesus and he abides in you, people look at you and you know what they're thinking about? They're not thinking about me. They're not thinking about you. They're thinking, man, that, that guy is like this with Jesus. That girl is like this with Jesus. What's showing up? The fruits of the Spirit. That's what's showing up. They say, I recognize that. I recognize that. I recognize that, boy. They took note that these men had been with Jesus. See? It's the fruit. Acts 4.13. It's the fruit. That's it. That's it. You know what that means? We'll finish the sentence here. Living in Christ, adhering or clinging to Christ, supported by Christ, drawing nourishment from Christ, you bear fruit after the likeness, the similitude is the likeness of Jesus. I'm telling you what, ladies and gentlemen, see the two sides? See, here's the salvation coin, two sides. Every side is Jesus. It is Jesus from stem to stern. It is the faith of Jesus. Both sides. We are in Christ. He is in us. It's Jesus from beginning to end. And that's good news, because if it depends on you and it depends on me, curtains. It's not my faith. It's not your faith. It's the faith of Jesus that he's offering you and me today. I will put my trust in him. You know what that means? Jot it down. One last fill in the blank. If you want to abide in Christ and you want him to abide in you, Every day, ask for the faith of Jesus as you read the Word of God. Now, I'm going to repeat that a thousand times right now. Every day, ask for the faith of Jesus as you read the Word of God. Every day, in fact, say it out loud with me. Every day, ask for the faith of Jesus as you read the Word of God. Come on, let's do it again. Every day, ask for the faith of Jesus as you read the Word of God. That's it. That's it. Both sides of the coin are now dealt with. You're okay, and I'm okay, because we have the faith of Jesus. I'm telling you what. I'm just saying... It is through the Word. What did we just read? It is through the Word that Christ abides in us. And oh, by the way, when Christ abides in you and you abide in Him, guess what? You will not only bear much fruit. No, 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 no. But it will be the beginning of a story of a friendship that will last forever and ever. Amen. That's it. That's the teaching. Take it home. Take it into your heart. I want to pray with you after we sing two stanzas. Ralph Carmichael, this is a great piece. Steve, you know this piece well. The Savior is waiting to enter your heart. It's, just, it's I want to come in. It's, it's, it's the Laodicean invitation. Let, I'm knocking. Let me in. There are only two stanzas to it, so ushers, please stand. Please go, and let's go. Let's sing.
I just asked Professor Zork. God, what a, what a what an appeal! The Savior is standing, waiting, knocking to enter your heart. Time and and again, He has knocked. Oh God, if there if there is somebody here right now who's hearing the knocking. And knows who it is. For that man, for that woman, please, just a touch of the faith of Jesus in that heart to have the courage to open the door from the inside and invite the Savior in. Oh God, it's a, it's, it's a big deal. We abide in you. You abide in us, and the fruit grows. So thank you. Thank you that the truth is all wrapped up in Jesus, the faith of Jesus. We go today with that faith in our hearts, His faith, His promise, His word. And now may the grace of Jesus and the love of the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. I want to take an extra moment to thank you for joining us in worship today. It's by the continued support from viewers like you that we're able to bring this telecast. Today, I want to invite you, though, to share with us how this ministry has blessed you. Truth is, I get inspiring notes, emails, letters from viewers literally all over the world sharing with us how God has blessed them through this program, and I'd love to hear from you as well. It's not that hard. It's simple, really. Just visit our website, newperceptions.tv. That's one word, newperceptions.tv. And click on the contact link at the top of the page. Shoot me that email. Once again, thank you for being with us. Thank you, by the way, for your own support. That support is what keeps this telecast week after week reaching America, reaching North America, and reaching the planet. That kind of generosity that you share is a huge boost and blessing to us. And I hope you'll join us right here next time because we'll be here. In the meantime, God be with you and bless you real good.